In this video, we're going to talk about the Z-transform. First of all, what is the Z-transform? It is a function that is computed, as you see here. Of course, uh, anytime you see infinite limits on a sum, uh, the real definition is in terms of a limiting process. Uh, but um, just like the DTFT, this is a transform on a possibly infinitely long sequence, x of n. And uh, you can see here how this is constructed. Um, importantly, as we'll talk about, um, this function is defined over a set of points on the complex plane uh, that are in this thing called the region of convergence, ROC. We'll have a lot more to say about that. Uh, but the thing to note here is that um, this is a function of a complex variable. And it, it itself, it can be, um, it can take on complex values, so it would have a magnitude and a phase potentially if we wanted to look at it that way. Um, the second equation shown here shows how you calculate the inverse Z transform. It's a little bit more complicated than what we're used to with the Fourier transform. Um, this notation here, an integral with this circle, this refers to a counterclockwise contour integration in the complex plane where this, this uh, contour lies in the region of convergence. We're not going to have very much to say about this. If you're interested in learning more about this kind of an integral, you'll have to take a class on complex variables from the math department. Uh, the, again, I want to emphasize that the z-transform, to fully specify the z-transform of a sequence x of n, you must specify two things. One is this function x of z, and the other is the region of convergence. We'll see why both of those are necessary. Um, and just to uh, reiterate, the region of convergence is the set of points z in the complex plane, the z-plane, where this sum converges. Now, as I said before, the z-transform is a function that's defined over a uh, the independent variable z is a complex number. So it's defined over this plane, uh, the complex plane. And um, so this is unlike a lot of the functions that we've seen before where it's a function of only one variable, like the Fourier transform is a function of frequency, um, which is a real variable. <clears throat> this function is defined over the complex plane, so we need to think about this function more as if it was a surface um, rather than just a curve or the graph of a, of a single dimensional variable. And um, in these plots, we're showing the magnitude. Remember, the, the z-transform could have a magnitude and a phase. But here, we're showing just the magnitude on the, on the vertical axis. And in the, in, the other, uh, in the horizontal plane here, you have the real and imaginary parts of the complex variable z. So the mesh that you're seeing here is the function uh, in both of these pictures. You can see it's kind of an exotic-looking function, uh, or it can, can take on a lot of different shapes. In the complex plane, we'll, um, I want to call your attention to this red line. That is the unit circle. And then lying above that circle, you could trace out all of the points on the graph that lie above the unit circle. And um, you could do that for both of these functions. And you'd, um, <clears throat> oops. And you could trace out. Um, another function. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so um, let's move on and maybe we'll come back to this if we need to. But for the time being, I want you to think about the z-transform as if it was a surface over the z-plane. And um, sometimes it will be necessary for us to slice this surface at the points lying above the unit circle. So these points that are highlighted in blue here, that are on the function, evaluated um, at the unit circle, these, these points will take on a uh, very important meaning to us further ahead. So how is the z-transform related to other transforms that we're familiar with? For example, the discrete time Fourier transform. Both of these are transforms of infinite sequences. And to understand this relationship better, um, I want you to th think about a polar representation for the complex variable z, where r is the radius. So for any complex number z, think of r as the radius, and then 2 pi f as the angle of that complex number. So here we have the definition of the z-transform on the far left. 
And then into that, we're going to substitute this um, expression for z, the polar representation for z. Uh, and you can see that happening here. Remember, we have z to the minus n, so we're going to have r to the minus n, e to the minus j2 pi fn. So after we do that substitution, if we regroup the terms inside the second sum and lump the r to the minus n with x, we see that this now looks identical to the discrete time Fourier transform. But now it's the discrete time Fourier transform not just of x, but of x times this um, exponential signal r to the negative n. And what this does is it gives us a relationship between the Z transform and the discrete time Fourier transform. So the Z transform is not all that different from the Fourier transform, um, but it is different in, in some important ways, as we'll see. Um, so uh, in particular, I want to highlight this and we'll talk about this a little bit more. So, so you could get the discrete time Fourier transform by evaluating the Z transform at points lying on the unit circle. So think about what's going on here. We've just showed this relationship between the Z-transform and the DTFT of a modified version of the sequence. Now if you let R equal 1 here, you can see that um, we're restricting attention. Again, you can put R equal 1 into this equation. We're, if we did that, we would be restricting attention to only those values of Z that are equal to e to the j2 pi f. And we know that those are the points lying on the unit circle. So if we um, let r equal 1, again, this is just now the DTFT of x of n. And so we can say that the DTFT of x of n is equal to the z transform evaluated at the unit circle. So if we go back up to these graphs, um, th this mesh that you see here, this two-dimensional surface, is the magnitude of the z transform. And if you want to know what the discrete time for your transform is, you just slice this mesh on uh, at points lying above the unit circle, and you would have the DTFT. Um, once again, over here, you know, if we took this and evaluated the mesh at points lying above the unit circle, we would have the DTFT. And as you know, the DTFT is a periodic function, and the periodicity comes from just wrapping around this unit circle um, as many times as you want. You generate a periodic function. Now, we also know that the, the DTFT is periodic with period 1. And so um, minus 1 half represents being on the negative uh, real axis. So that would be, um, if I can figure out where this is. Um, anyway, mi minus 1 half would be uh, frequencies, say, over here. And then positive 1 half would be frequencies all the way around. So if you just take this function that's highlighted here in blue and unwrap that and lay it out flat, you would be looking at the DTFT. That's true in both of these cases that are pictured here. Oh, and in fact, um, here they are um, presented for us in the manner that we're familiar with. So um, in this case, the author uh, that created these plots, um, instead of using a, f a normalized frequency axis between minus a half and a half, they're showing it in omega, uh, which goes from minus pi to pi. But you can see that if you took this blue line on the surface over here, sliced it, and then unwrapped it, you would, you would get this picture right here, which is a discrete time Fourier transform. So that's showing us, again, the relationship between the, the Z transform, which is the surface, uh, and the Fourier transform, which is just this blue line. Here's that other example. Again, if we take this uh, function that's represented here in blue and sliced it open and wrapped it and unwrapped it and laid it out flat, we would get this um, kind of a sink-like function that you see here. So again, you could think of the Z-transform then as being a generalization out to the entire complex plane of the discrete time Fourier transform or of the, Z the Fourier transform as a restriction of the Z-transform to the unit circle. Let's take a look at an example here. Uh, for a particular sequence, and that sequence is a to the n times u of n. Let's assume that the magnitude of a is less than 1, so that this is a sequence whose envelope is decreasing as we move towards positive, positive infinity. Uh, of course, this is a causal sequence. It's 0 for negative values of n. And uh, we know this is a pretty simple one because the DTFT can be calculated using a simple geometric series argument. 
and uh, we get this form that you see here. If we were to calculate the Z transform of that same sequence, we would get uh, this expression here. Again, it's just simply a uh, geometric series uh, calculation. Um, when, we, when we do this with the Z transform, we, we have to make an extra uh, consideration here. You, you see that when you combine in the DTFT A to the N and E to the minus J2 pi Fn, the magnitude of the uh, term being exponentiated is equal to the magnitude of A, which we know is less than 1, and so we can write down uh, this uh, without any additional um, statements. Uh, because the exponential has magnitude 1. But when, we, when we're down here in the, the Z transform expression, A times Z to the minus 1 is being raised to the N. And so we have to make this additional statement that A times Z to the minus 1 has to be less than 1 in magnitude in order for us to apply that geometric series formula. So this then becomes our statement about the region of convergence. Any Z for which this inequality holds is in the region of convergence. So this expression here does not hold for every z in the entire z-plane. It only holds for some z's in the z-plane. And those z's are called, that set of z's is called the region of convergence. The other thing that you can see here is the, uh, the um, relation between the z and transform and the DTFT. Um, if you look at these two sums, you can see that the DTFT comes from simply evaluating the Z transform at Z equal E to the J 2 pi F. And then, then the Z transform becomes the discrete time Fourier transform. We also know that there is a relationship between the discrete Fourier transform and the discrete time Fourier transform. Um, and that relationship, we've looked at this before, is that the, the DFT is a set of points uniformly sampled between 0 and 1 uh, on the frequency axis. And because there's a relationship between the DTFT and the Z transform, we could also say that the DFT comes from n uniformly spaced samples around the unit circle. It's interesting. So both of these transforms get their heritage from the Z transform. Uh, and this, this uh, illustrates that again, um, that concept. So here the blue line represents the unit circle and in this case I've chosen to let n equal 10 and so uh, imagine again we're just imagining that there's some surface lying above this um, plane, the z-plane, and to get the DTFT we would evaluate that surface at points on the unit circle that would give us the DTFT and then if we evaluate it at these discrete points on the unit circle, evaluate that surface at these discrete points, we would get the 10-point DFT. Of course, if you evaluate it at 100 points uniformly spaced around the unit circle, you would get the 100-point DFT, and so on. All right, now let's talk about convergence. And we can talk about all three of these transforms and their convergence properties. When we began talking about the DTFT, we talked about three different kinds of signals. The first kind were absolutely summable. These were also known as stable sequences. And these are sequences that mathematically obeyed this expression where if you took all the values in the sequence, took their magnitudes, their absolute values, and added them all up, that would sum to some finite number as long as it didn't diverge to infinity, then we would call that sequence summable or stable. And for those kinds of sequences, the DTFT converged uniformly to a continuous, even a differentiable function. And uh, we could calculate the DTFT simply by plugging into the transform formula and cranking out the answer for, for many of the cases. There was another kind of category of signals called energy signals. And these are signals that uh, were square summable so if you squared the values, added them all up, basically calculate the energy in the sequence, you would get a finite number. That's an energy signal, as long as it didn't diverge to infinity. And um, for these kinds of signals, um, the Fourier transform converged in the mean square. And these uh, kinds of signals typically had discontinuities in the Fourier transform. 
Uh, examples included things like a sync function, which is the impulse response of an ideal low-pass filter, has that discontinuity between pass and stop bands. And other examples include the ideal Hilbert transformer, has discontinuities. And another example is um, the ideal differentiator, is also one of these energy signals. And the third category were power signals. And these are ones, are, are sequences for which uh, the power, when you do this power calculation, you get a finite number. Um, these kinds of signals typically had Dirac delta functions in their Fourier transform. That was kind of the giveaway, which means that at that frequency where the Dirac function activates, um, there's, there's no convergence concepts going on at all there. And that Dirac, Dirac function is basically telling us that at that frequency, this summation, the DTFT summation, is actually diverging. <clears throat> of course, when we got to the DFT, the DFT only applies to finite length signals, and so there were really no convergence questions to talk about. <clears throat> the DFT converges um, for all sequences. Um, and then, and then we get to the Z transform. And we've already seen that the Z transform converges wherever, um, the, that the Z transform is equal to the DTFT of a modified sequence, X of N times R to the negative N. And um, so we're going to go back and rely upon the absolute summability of the DTFT, uh, but it is, it's the absolute summability of this modified version of the sequence. So <clears throat> the Z transform, um, we don't have the luxury of uh, talking about mean square convergence or convert, you know, some kind of weird convergence for power signals where it converges at some frequencies and not at others. <clears throat> Instead, we're not going to do that. We're only going to allow one kind of convergence, and that is um, where this modified sequence x of n times r to the negative n, this has to, has to be absolutely summable. So if there is a z whose radius or magnitude is uh, gives you a square summable signal here, then that z is in the region of convergence for the z transform. And otherwise, it's not. Not every signal does have a z transform. For example, many signals we're accustomed to working with don't have z transforms. Things like everlasting complex exponentials, sines and cosines, periodic signals, constants, um, even <clears throat> these uh, other exponential kinds of signals is everlasting. Though none of those things have z transforms. So not everything has a z transform. And some things that have Z-transforms um, don't have DTFTs, as we'll see. So let's um, <clears throat> look at this concept a little bit more. Uh, and again, we're presenting at the top of the page here the definition of the Z-transform with the polar representation for Z substituted in, like we've seen before. And the set of points where this sum converges is the region of convergence in the Z-plane. And if we do a little bit of uh, manipulation on this expression, taking the magnitude of both sides and then applying the triangle inequality, uh, also re re recognizing that the magnitude of the exponential is 1, throwing that away, we see that <clears throat> an upper bound for the magnitude of the z-transform is this sum right here. So as long as this sum is bounded, uh, z is going to be in the region of convergence. We can guarantee you that. But the other thing that's interesting that we can conclude from this is that because the phase of the complex number has disappeared from the calculation, we, we can conclude <clears throat> that regions of convergence are going to have circular shapes because they only depend on the radius of z, not on the phase. So here's a couple of facts to keep in mind about regions of convergence. One, the region of convergence is connected. You're not going to have two disjoint sets um, be in the region of convergence. The second thing is that the region of convergence may not contain any poles. Well, we haven't really defined what poles are, but just keep that in mind for the future. <clears throat> the next prop property is that, um, in general, the region of convergence will either be outside of a circle, inside a circle, or in an annular region, a donut-shaped region or a ring-shaped region. So those are uh, three cases are illustrated here at the bottom of the slide. Um, on the left, 
The region of convergence is shown here in blue. Again, this is the complex plane where Z lives. And in this case, we would um, say that uh, the region of convergence is outside of a circle. Notice that um, the circle itself is not included in the region. So um, uh, this is an open set. And uh, it's often denoted, like you see here mathematically, magnitude of Z is greater than the magnitude of A. So we would say that in this case, A is a complex number that lives right on this circle somewhere. We haven't indicated it. But A would be a number, a complex number on the circle. The magnitude of A then is the radius of this circle. And so this, this expression really right here is shorthand for saying that it's the set of all Z's whose magnitudes lie outside the magnitude of A. And that's a circular region, and that's the outside a circle region. Um, if we just flip that inequality around, uh, we could say that uh, another kind of region of convergence that we'll encounter is inside of a circle. Again, the circle itself is not included in the region. And um, you can combine both of these ideas so if we're, if we're lying below some outer radius and above some inner radius, you get this annular region. So uh, in general, this is everything that we're going to encounter in terms of regions of convergence in the z-plane. Let's take a look at, at the kinds of signals that you get for these different kinds of regions of convergence, because there are some correspondences that, that are important to uh, look at here. So um, on the first one is, uh, let, let's suppose we have this causal signal. Um, again, this is just a decaying. You see the picture of it here. A, if A is a real number, then we just get this decaying, a real positive number. We just get this decaying um, exponential behavior. It starts at time zero. That's due to this, the multiplication with the step function. So this is a causal signal. It continues on out to infinity, even though I've stopped the plot at time 20. Um, and if we plug that in and uh, crank out this Z transform, we use a geometric series argument and get this expression that you see here. Uh, the magnitude of um, A times Z to the minus 1 defines our region of convergence. Uh, as long as that number is less than 1 in magnitude, we're in the region of convergence. And we can do a little bit of math on this and rewrite this region of convergence argument like you see here. So we have magnitude of Z is greater than some A. And so that, that corresponds to an outside of a circle uh, region of convergence. Here's the correspondence. If you see a causal signal, you're going to get convergence outside of a circle. Let's look at another case. This is a causal signal. Here's a case where we have a non-causal, but it's still right-sided. In other words, it's decaying as we move out towards positive infinity. It just turns on before time zero. So we can't really call this causal, but it's still right-sided. And I'm not going to drag, drag us all through the math, but again, it's the same conclusion in the end. Right-sided signals, like causal signals, have regions of convergence that lie outside of a circle in the z-plane. The interesting thing that happens here is that that outside of a circle region does not include the point at infinity. Why is that? Well, it's, it, it comes back to this uh, z-transform expression here. You have to ask yourself, what values of z am I not allowed to plug into this expression? And you can see that if you put z equal infinity here, um, the numerator of this expression would go off towards infinity. So we have to say, no, z can't take on the value of infinity. So it's slightly modified. We have to say it's outside a circle except for the point at infinity. That's for non-causal right-sided right um, sequences. Let's do the same thing, but let's turn it around and go towards negative infinity. Here's a sequence that turns on at time negative 1 and then decays as we move out towards negative infinity. If you go through the math and do the same sorts of things, you find out that, that the region of convergence for this kind of a signal, for left-sided or anti-causal signals, converges inside a circle where the radius of that circle is equal to the value of this number that's being exponentiated here. And that's important. To note. Here's a non-anti-causal left-sided sequence. Okay, so again, this one turns on um, at positive times, but it, again, it decays towards negative infinity. Um, so this is going to be a left-sided signal. Once again, the convergence is inside a circle, but we have to be careful because we're going to note that we ask ourselves, okay, what values of z am I not allowed to plug into this expression? You can see here that one of the values we cannot plug in is z equals zero because we'd, we'd be dividing by zero. 
So um, z equals zero is excluded from the region of convergence. So this is inside a circle except for the point at z equals zero. Okay, now here's a two-sided doubly infinite signal. This one goes off to, to it decays as we go toward minus infinity. It also decays as we go towards negative infinity. Um, so if we look at this, we can take the z transform in parts. We have a to the n u of n. That's going to converge to something of this form. And the region of convergence is going to, for, for this term, will lie outside of a circle of radius a. And then if we have one of these um, terms that decays as we move towards negative infinity, um, that's going to give us a similar looking um, expression here. But the z transform converges inside a circle of radius magnitude b. Putting these two um, constraints on z together, the combined region of convergence is all those points that have magnitudes greater than magnitude a and less than magnitude b. And so that's going to give us convergence in an annular region. So again, the thing I want you to remember here is that if you have a doubly infinite signal that, that uh, is from minus infinity to plus infinity, the convergence is going to be in an annular region. So if we go back and just review what we've learned so far, if we have a causal or right-sided signal we're decaying, we're, the region of convergence is outside of a circle. If we have an anti-causal signal, a left-sided signal, the convergence is inside a circle. And if we have a two-sided signal that's going out to plus and minus infinity, we're both inside of one circle and outside of another circle. So that gives us convergence in this annular region. Okay, here are some finite length signals. So we're not infinite going in either direction. The first case is a simple delta function where it turns on at the origin. If you calculate the z transform of this, it's just a constant. And the region of convergence is the entire z plane. There are no points that are not allowed in this z transform expression here. Now if we look at another finite length signal, it's a sum of three delta functions. One of them turns on at time negative one, one turns on at time zero, and one turns on at time plus one. So you get these three delta functions that you see here. If you calculate the z transform, you get this expression. And then you say to yourself, well, what values of z can I not put in to this expression? And well, you can see that z equal infinity is not allowed because that would make this z term uh, go off to infinity. And you can also see that z equals zero is not allowed because that would be dividing by zero and that would send this one off to infinity. And so it's the entire, the region of convergence then is the entire z plane except for the point at the origin and the point at infinity. Okay, so let's, let's go back and review just to, just to make sure this is really clear. Causal and right-sided signals converge outside a circle. Anti-causal or left-sided signals converge inside a circle. Two-sided sequences converge, if they converge at all, in a ring or an annular region. And finite length signals that um, don't go out to plus or minus infinity in either direction, they're finite length, they converge in general on the whole entire z plane, except possibly for the point at zero and the point at infinity. Those have to be considered as special cases. Um, let's look at another finite length signal. This is a causal finite length signal. You can see it here. It's uh, length 10 and it, it decays over that uh, interval, uh, which is less important, but um, we can do, do a little bit of math on this. So um, again, with a finite length sequence, uh, if you plug into the z-transform, uh, you see that um, we get this if you just write out the terms of the z transform, we get this expansion in terms of z to the negative one. And we see by looking at this that we cannot put z equals zero into these terms. And so z equals zero is the forbidden point. That point is not in the region of convergence. So the, so the, so the, z, the, um, the region of convergence for this z transform is the entire z plane, except for the point at zero. Um, so again, finite length signals in general, you converge in the entire z-plane, except for maybe zero or infinity. Um, here's, here's another example. Uh, this is also a finite length sequence. And again, if you, uh, if you write out the terms, you see that it, for negative times, those terms give z to a positive power in n. 
power of n, and if you uh, go to positive times, you get z to the negative power. And so that, that forbids the, these terms over here at negative times forbid infinity from being in the region of convergence, and these uh, negative powers of z forbid zero from being in the region of convergence, just driving that concept home. So the region of convergence is the entire z-plane, except for the point at zero and the point at infinity. All right, so we can see that there's a lot going on with z-transforms. There's the expression x of z itself, and then there's also the region of convergence. So what does this region of convergence tell us? Can it tell us anything else? Um, and why is it so important? Well, let's just take a look at some examples here. Here I'm showing three different signals. Um, here we have one that is stable. It's causal and stable. Here's one that's maybe you'd say marginally stable, but I'd say unstable. Um, and this is the signal that is, uh, this is another signal that's unstable. Well, all of these signals have Z transforms. And in fact, the expression for the Z transform is essentially the same. The, X, the, the expression X of Z for all of these is essentially the same. Um, and it's given by this. Uh, 1 over 1 minus a, z to the minus 1. The only difference between these three examples that we're looking at is that the value of a is different. In one case, a is less than 1 in magnitude. In one case, a is equal to 1 in magnitude. And in the other case, a is equal to a number greater than 1 in magnitude. And so what's happening in these three cases is that uh, what's changing is the region of convergence in all cases, the regions of convergence are outside of a circle. But notice the relationship between the regions of convergence and the unit circle. So in these pictures, the, of region of convergence pictures, or z-plane pictures, I've, I've uh, drawn the unit circle in blue. So here, notice that we have a stable sequence and the unit circle is a subset of the region of convergence. We know that when that happens, the DTFT exists. I mean, let's go back to this, this expression that we derived earlier, which relates the DTFT to the Z-transform. It says that the DTFT is equal to the Z-transform evaluated on the unit circle. So if the unit circle lies in the region of convergence, then we can evaluate the Z-transform on the unit circle and get and obtain the DTFT. So if the unit circle is in the region of convergence, then the DTFT exists. And we can say that the sequence is summable, and which is the same as saying that it's stable, which is the same thing as saying that DTFT exists. These, these three statements are equivalent. So we can at least say that when the unit circle is in the region of convergence, the DTFT exists. This is a causal, this is a causal because the region is outside the unit is outside a circle. And um, that the DTFT exists, it's a summable stable sequence. Okay. In this second case and the third case, notice that the re that the unit circle is not in the region of convergence. And therefore, these sequences are unstable and the DTFT does not exist. Um, in, in this middle case here, the unit circle is on the boundary of the region of convergence. But remember, the boundary of the region of convergence, these circles do not, are not contained within the region of convergence. They're the boundary, but they're not in, in the set. And here you see that the region of convergence lies, um, uh, or, or that the, the unit circle is not contained within the region of convergence because the, the circle bounding the region of convergence is, has a radius larger than 1. So, so the region of convergence, what does it tell us? It tells us about the existence of the DTFT. We cannot, for example, in this third case, evaluate the, DT, the, I'm sorry, evaluate the Z transform on the unit circle because the unit circle is not even in the region of convergence. X of Z doesn't exist at these points. So, um, that's, uh, that's what the region of convergence, one of the things it can tell us. So let's, let's take a look at uh, this in a little bit more detail, then we'll move on. Um, 
Again, let's consider the, C, the signal a to the n u of n. And um, so, so if you look back at this, at this example, so, so take a look at this sequence right here. This sequence is diverging. It's, it's blowing up. It's going off to positive infinity. How is it possible that this sequence can have a Z transform? I mean, I claim that it does and that the Z transform exists at all of these points that are shaded in blue out here. But how is that possible, given that this sequence is blowing up towards, towards positive infinity as the time argument moves out to infinity? That's what we're looking at here. Okay, oops. So let's take that sequence and plug it in. Let's use again the polar representation for z. Plug that in as well. And then if we combine these terms a and r together, um, and let, let's think about this for a second. So even if the value of a is greater than 1, so that the sequence is blowing up, as long as r is greater than a, then a divided by r to the n is a decaying sequence, and we can still perform the summation. And so this helps us understand that when we choose a value out here for z, a value of z that has a larger value than a, if we multiply that z, um, the reciprocal of that z, because of the negative sign, times a, we get a, we get a and then raise it to the power n, we get a decaying sequence in the summation. And so it, it becomes a geometric sum and we can, we can perform that. So the difference between uh, these two situations is that in one case, um, the unit circle is contained in the region of convergence, and in the other case, the unit circle is not contained in the region of convergence. Okay, now to the question, why is this region of convergence thing all that important? Well, let's take a look at these two signals. So here I have a causal decaying signal, and here I have an anti-causal decaying signal. Here's the, the time domain expression for the causal one, and the time domain expression for the anti-causal one. Um, uh, the one on the left uh, converges outside a circle, the one on the right converges inside a circle, but when you calculate the z-transform of these two things, you get exactly the same expression for x of z. In other words, if I handed you this x of z, and I said, what's the inverse z-transform? You could not tell me. Or a complete answer would be, well, there are two inverse z transforms of this x of z. One corresponds to a region of convergence lying outside of the magnitude of a. That gives you a causal um, stable, in this example, by the picture, uh, decaying complex exponential or, or de decaying exponential sequence. The other part of your answer would be, well, if you look, think about a region of convergence lying inside a circle of radius magnitude a, then you get an anti-causal um, sequence. So um, the, the moral of the story here is when you're specifying a z-transform, always, always, always specify two things. One is x, an expression for x of z, and the other is to specify the region of convergence. Let's take a look at an example here. So here's a, here's a time domain sequence. It's um, x to the, it's a 1 half to the n u of n, so there's a causal portion here. And then here's negative 1 third to the n u of minus n minus 1. So this actually um, is an anti-causal piece. And um, if, if we take the z transform of these, we can do that very, very easily. Uh, we get this expression, magnitude z greater than 1 half. And here we have magnitude z, um, we have this expression with magnitude z less than 1 third. Now, so we, we've, we've got the analytical expression. All we have to do is subtract these two expressions, and we can have the expression for the z transform. But then if we look at the region of convergence, notice here that magnitude z has to be greater than 1 half in order for this expression to apply. And here the magnitude of z has to be less than 1 third for this expression to apply. Unfortunately, if you look at the intersection of these two sets, there are no values of z that uh, meet both of these requirements. The region of convergence is the empty set. There's no z's that you can plug in here and get a converging x of z uh, expression. So in this case, even though it looks like a very harmless sequence, 
we would have to say that the z-transform for the sequence does not exist. Let's take a look at another sequence. Um, here we have two causal portions. Notice that in the previous example, this looks a lot like the previous example, here we have a causal portion and an anti-causal portion. So the causal portion gives you convergence outside a circle, the anti-causal portion give you, gives you convergence inside a circle, and those circles didn't overlap. Here, both parts are causal, and so we can just simply uh, write down the Z-transform now. We've done this one enough times, we can pretty much just write down these Z-transforms. And um, we, we would say that the region of convergence of this uh, sum is going to be the intersection of the two regions. So we would say that the, um, the region of convergence would be outside a circle of radius 1 half because those points are in the region of convergence for both this term and this term. But what we want to do now is talk about poles and zeros. Um, if you find a common denominator and uh, add these expressions together, you end up with something that looks kind of like this. This has also been re-expressed in terms of z instead of z to the minus 1. But the, the zeros of this rational function, it's rational because the numerator is a polynomial in z, the denominator is a polynomial in z, so that's referred to as a rational function. Um, the zeros are the roots of the numerator polynomial, and they are in this case 0 and 1 12th, because I've gone ahead and written it in its factored form. And the poles are the, the roots of the denominator polynomial. I've written the polynomial in factored form in the denominator, so we can see explicitly the roots are one half and negative one third. Let's just keep these definitions for poles and zeros in mind as we move ahead. Um, again, if we take that same expression and uh, find that common denominator and express it all in its details here, uh, we get this, uh, these two uh, polynomials in terms of z to the minus one that you see here. And um, the reason I wanted to write it this way is because um, we're often going to turn to MATLAB well, this is not the only reason, of course, but uh, when we do turn to MATLAB, MATLAB's internal representation for rational functions is to collect the coefficients of these polynomials um, into vectors. So here, this polynomial in the numerator would be uh, represented by the vector 2, negative 1 sixth, because those are the coefficients um, of this polynomial. And then the denominator polynomial would be uh, expressed as a vector of 1, negative 1 sixth, negative 1 sixth, because again those are the coefficients um, of this polynomial. And then there's MATLAB functions for like drawing pictures of the pole zero plot in the z-plane. If you just call z-plane b comma a, that's the numerator vector and the denominator vector, MATLAB will pump out this picture for you. Um, the circle is the unit circle, and then you see the, the uh, axes for the real part and the imaginary part of the complex number z. Um, poles are expressed as x's here, and zeros are expressed as circles. Um, so again, yeah, we, we know that there's um, zeros, two zeros at, at uh, 0 and 1 twelfth, and then the poles are at um, 1 half and negative 1 third. So now we know about poles and zeros of rational functions and pole zero plots. Let's go back and look at one other thing that the region of convergence can, can give us clues about. Um, if, if I say that x of z is, uh, corresponds to a causal sequence in the time domain, then that tells us that the region of convergence lies outside of the outermost pole. Why does it have to be the outermost pole? Well, if you had multiple poles, um, each pole, you can draw a circle through each pole. And uh, the circles are centered at the origin, of course. And um, we, because poles are not allowed in the region of convergence, if you tried to uh, have a, a region outside of a circle um, that is defined by one of these um, smaller poles, uh, then that circle would, and extending out to infinity, that, cir that region would have to include a pole that has a larger magnitude. So basically, if the signal is causal, then its region of convergence in the z domain lies outside the outermost pole, the outermost pole being the pole having the largest magnitude. 
Um, if we also say that x of z is a stable or corresponds to a stable sequence x of n in the time domain, then that means that, that the region of convergence must include the unit circle. So if we put both of these things together, if we say that x of n is both causal and stable, then how would we guarantee that both the unit circle lie in the region of convergence and that the region of convergence lie outside the outermost pole? Well, what that must uh, mean is that all of the poles would lie inside the unit circle. So let's take a look. In this first example, we see that here's a pole lying inside the unit circle. The region of convergence is outside that because it's causal. And, the, um, and it's stable because the region of convergence includes the unit circle. In these other two cases, uh, we do have a right-sided sequence, as you can see in the graphs, but um, these are not stable. So again, if we say a sequence is causal and stable, then um, all of its uh, poles must lie inside the unit circle. Now, uh, it's interesting that uh, if you're given, this is, this is the question that I asked you about before. I said, hey, look, if I give you this x of z, what is the inverse z transform? And uh, you know you don't really know without a specification of the region of convergence. So let's go. Let's take this example that we've been looking at. Now there again. Remember we have a pole at one half and we have a pole at one third. And as I said before, through each of these poles you can draw a circle at the origin. This blue circle, by the way, is the unit circle. And um, because we have these poles, the poles basically and the circles defined by these poles basically cut the the complex plane up into these regions. We have, in this case, three regions. There's the region lying outside the circle uh, of radius one half. There's the region lying in the annular region uh, between two circles of radius one third and one half. And then there's the, the region inside the innermost circle of radius one third. And for each of those regions, you can define a different inverse Z transform, as we'll see. Let's take a look at this. So here's the rational function. Uh, we would have to do some kind of a partial fraction expansion to get it into this form, but let's suppose that's not an issue and not hard to do. Let's, it's already done right here for us. We have these nice terms. We can look these up in tables, or we, we know from experience now that the inverse Z transform of this one is going to be 1 half to the n, u of n, and this one goes to um, uh, negative one third to the n u of n. Why did I know that these were the inverse transforms? Well, because what we do is we say, look, the region of convergence lies outside a circle of radius one half. So this one, this term, is going to contribute to the inverse Z transform a causal piece. And because the region of convergence lies outside a circle of radius one third, this one will also contribute a causal piece to this solution. Now let's look at what happens when we consider this annular region lying in between one-third and one-half. Well, if we go up here now, we look at, we look at each of these terms, and, and this term has a pole at one-half. Now, the region of convergence lies inside a circle of radius one-half, and therefore this term in the inverse transform is going to contribute an anti-causal piece. The region of convergence lies outside a circle of radius one-third, which is where the pole is on this term. It's actually at negative one-third. And so this one, because the region of convergence is outside, will contribute a causal piece. So this is times u of n. So this is actually a two-sided sequence. And as we saw before, two-sided sequences, we have an anti-causal part and a causal part. Um, uh, Two-sided sequences have regions of convergence that are in these annular regions. Finally, what happens with this third region of convergence that lies inside the innermost pole? Uh, well, in this case, both of these terms, the region of convergence for both of these terms, lies inside a circle with the corresponding pole here. And so therefore, each of these terms contributes an anti-causal piece to the answer. So the inverse Z transform, if this is given as the region of convergence, uh, gives us an anti-causal um, inverse Z transform. So you can see that given a rational function, 
there could be many inverse Z transforms. You have to specify the region of convergence or say something like the signal is causal or the signal is anti-causal or the signal is two-sided or something like that or, or the signal is stable. See, if I told you that the signal was stable, you'd automatically know that the region of convergence was magnitude z greater than one-half because that's the region that contains the unit circle. Notice that this region of convergence does not contain the unit circle. So while this signal is a two-sided sequence, we also know that this is not a stable sequence. The same is true for this one, because the unit circle does not lie in the region of convergence. This is anti-causal, but I can tell you if you were to make a plot of this, you wouldn't be able to plot for very far because the signal is blowing up as you go towards negative infinity. The only sequence that is both causal and stable here is, is the sequence you see pictured here. Okay, enough said on that. Again, specify the region of convergence or, um, or work the problem for every region of convergence that you can, you can devise given where the poles are. Um, here's another example um, with, a, with a finite length signal. Um, here we plug into the Z-transform formula. We can also factor out um, uh, Z to the M from the numerator and the denominator and get some cancellations going on. When we've expressed it in this form, we can more easily see that the um, zeros uh, have this form. They're a to the a times e to the j 2 pi k over m. So we get these m, uh, m zeros that um, move around a circle of radius a. And in the denominator we have a pole at zero. In fact it's an m minus one order pole at zero. And we also have a pole at z equal a. The interesting thing is that we have a zero at z equal a as well. And so we get a pole zero cancellation. Let's suppose a is a number. Uh, a is the number 0 0.8, which lies on the real axis right here. Uh, you see the unit circle in a uh, solid blue line here. So this is um, inside the unit circle at 0 0.8. And we get a pole zero cancellation occurring. So because there's not a pole at that location, the region of convergence is the entire z-plane, except for z equals zero because we have poles there. Notice that you can have zeros in the region of convergence. That's not a problem. You just cannot have poles in the region of convergence. To represent this finite length signal in MATLAB, I just want to point this out because um, you know, this could be useful. There's two different ways this could be done. One is to write out the z-transform terms. It's finite length, so this could be done. This terminates after some time. Um, and you can see that uh, representing this in MATLAB, it, 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 you, um, if you think of this as a rational function, you have this polynomial in the numerator, and in the denominator you just have the number 1. And so we say the denominator polynomial is given by 1, and the numerator polynomial has entries 1, a, a squared, and so on, up to a to the m minus 1. And we can perform that calculation very easily in MATLAB by just saying a raised to the power um, element-wise, 0 up to m minus 1. And so this will create a vector for us that has coefficients 1, that's a to the 0, um, a, that's a to the 1, a squared, a to the 2, and so on, out to a to the m minus 1. So this would be a valid way to represent this signal in MATLAB. Another way to represent this signal would be to go to the z-transform expression that you see up here, also repeated right here, that, that we obtain by applying the geometric series formula. And um, here we see a proper rational function. Uh, well, it's a rational function uh, where we have a numerator polynomial and a denominator polynomial. And so here in the denominator, we, the coefficients are 1 and negative a. And in the numerator, we have 1, and then we have 0 times z to the minus 1, 0 times z to the minus 2, 0 times z to the minus 3 and so on, all the way out to negative a to the m times z to the minus m. And so we would build that vector in MATLAB by putting 1, a bunch of zeros, and then negative a raised to the power m. You can, you can try uh, examples like this in MATLAB and you'll see that, that these are both valid ways to represent the same uh, information from a transfer function perspective in MATLAB. As with other transforms that we've encountered, um, 
you can look in books or online and find tables of Z transform pairs. So um, here, you know, we've seen examples like this already. Delta of n goes to 1. The region of convergence is the whole Z plane. The unit step function, we have this simple form. The magnitude of Z greater than 1 is the region of convergence. Um, here's an anti-causal unit step function. Um, same Z transform expression here. Uh, the only thing is that the region of convergence is inside a circle instead of outside a circle. Um, if we have a delay, then the Z transform is Z to the minus M if it's a delay by M. And you can look at the region of convergence in those cases. Again, uh, we've seen these two examples already. You have the same Z transform expression even though one is causal, one anti-causal. The difference being that the region of convergence is either outside a circle or inside a circle. And there's a bunch of other examples here in the table. Notice that all of these are either finite, like the last one, or they're infinite in length being multiplied by either a causal unit step function or an anti-causal unit step function. So, so notoriously, what's missing in this table? Well, we don't have everlasting sines, cosines, complex exponentials. Um, we don't have constants. We don't have uh, periodic signals, things like that because these signals do not have Z transforms. There's also Z transform properties, which we could spend time deriving. But we've already derived these properties for the DTFT and other transforms, and so I feel that we don't need to repeat those steps because the steps are all essentially the same. The only thing that we have to do now in addition is um, keep an eye on the uh, region of convergence that uh, might change as a result of these transforms. Uh, a couple of the important properties that we're going to refer to later are the convolution property. Notice that if you convolve in the time domain, you multiply in the z domain, and the region of convergence contains the intersection of the two regions of convergence. Also, you have conjugation properties, time reversal properties, time reversal and conjugation properties, um, and other sorts of things. There's also in the table something called the initial value theorem which says that um, if the signal is causal uh, then the steady or, or the infinite behavior of the Z transform is determined by that first sample in the sequence. There's also a final value theorem though it's not listed in the table in our book and I, I state that here. If, again if X of N is causal then uh, the final value of the sequence you can obtain by um, this limiting process on the Z transform. Okay, let's now move over and start talking a little bit about systems um, and the Z transform. So uh, the Z transform of the impulse response is called the transfer function of the system. Here's a simple example. If H of N is equal to delta N minus D, so this would be like for a delay, the Z transform is Z to the minus D. And you see this often in Z tran or in signal processing block diagrams. You'll see blocks labeled H of Z, which means that this is a linear time invariant system, and it has a Z transform given by H of Z. Um, for a simple delay block in a signal processing diagram, you might see something like this, where you have Z to the minus D. So often you have single delays, so that would be Z to the minus 1.